Hey everyone and welcome back to another episode of It Ain't Week to Speak. My name is Sam Webb and this show is dedicated to ending the stigma around mental health through community, connection and the hard hitting truth. I'll be speaking with guests from all over the world about life to inspire and to educate people to speak up so that we can save more lives. Thank you for joining me on this journey. I'm actually very, very lucky to have stolen this guy away from uh, the gym. He's been pumping biceps. <laughs> but let's welcome none other than the man himself, Daniel Price. Danny Price, how are you, brother? I'm really well, mate. It's good to see your face. It's been a while, bro. Mate, it has. It has. We, we, definitely... we, miss, you. we miss you down here in Sydney, brother. How's the, how's the Bondi beaches, mate, without me down there? <laughs> I'd be safer. Mate, it, it's, a bit, it's a bit safer, mate, without your head running around. Yeah, no, nah, mate, it's, it's good. You know, living down in Bondi is, um, is amazing, although I don't get to experience quite as much as I'd like, you know, with, with working full time. But, mate, it's great. I'm, I'm loving, uh, loving being down there and, and living in Sydney. It's a good vibe. And, and, a, and a family man nowadays as well, Pricey. I am. I am, yeah. Got um, lovely little Tallulah that is. Um, Seven, she's 17, nearly 18 months old, which is crazy. Time and um, I've actually, uh, actually got, um, got some news for you, brother. Um, I might as well just do this now because this is pretty funny. Um, this was taken uh, yesterday. What the fuck? Mate, congratulations. <laughs> You're having another baby. Another baby, 13 You're weeks, kidding. mate. Mate, congratulations, yeah. brother. Yeah, How good is that? Uh, it's amazing. Very exciting. It, the baby's due on Tallulah's second birthday. <laughs> You're kidding. Mate, so that's weird. awesome. So after the miscarriage last year, which, as you know, we can talk about really knocked us both around at about 10 weeks, you know, we'd really started to, to you know, feel like we were growing our family. We'd met the baby on the screen and heard the heartbeat and then it didn't work out. It was, it was a really, really tough thing to go through, especially for Sarah being in hospital and being unwell through that process. And, so to, to get over the sort of into the safe zone just um, through that first trimester um, this week um, is, yeah, it's amazing. It's, it's a big weight off our shoulders. You know, Sarah was, um, was very emotional after the scan, obviously just so relieved. Um, mm. But made a, yeah, amazing times for us, exciting. You know, it's going to be amazing to see Tallulah be a, a, an older sister to Whoever it is, boy or girl, we don't know. We keep it a surprise like surprise. last time. But made some amazing, yeah, yeah. amazing times, you know. But with, well, mate, with that comes a lot of, um, you know, a lot of challenges and stress around finances, moving house. Is our house big enough? Can we afford to live in Bondi? Do we have to move? All these questions um, are coming up at the moment. So, um, you know, with great news um, like that comes a lot of um, a lot of thought and and you know discussion around transition. And, you know that life the way life goes but yeah very very exciting well mate congratulations uh again i know that it's going to be an exciting few months uh planning and and getting everything sorted yeah. and whatever transition that takes you on in your life i'm sure that you'll you and sarah and Tallulah will will be able to handle and accommodate that um no doubt that's for sure mate yeah. and, and i want to dig deeper into that impact that you know a miscarriage had on obviously yourself on a relationship sure. and as sure. a family union but before we dive into that mate i do want to mm. i want to find out exactly how, how did you and i want people to know and i want to educate people how you became known to living and how living became known to you and how our relationship started you know more or less sure. uh, as a very good friends and and the work that we've done together over the years yeah, absolutely. And I, I do think it's a really important place to start. It, it makes sense to start there for this chat. Um, something that we haven't spoken about for years. Um, feels like we're, uh, feels like, you know, we've been mates for forever. Um, I know we've said that before. And I think that's because we, we you know, came to be mates through something um, that's so powerful and so close to both of our hearts um, for, for fairly different experiences. Um, yours being um, suicide grief and loss of Dwayne um, and the amazing um, thing that you and Casey started in, in living. And, um, you know, I wouldn't be where I am today uh, working in the mental health space and, and have, having shared my story around the globe if it wasn't for living. Um, that's um, hand on heart fact. So I, 
for, for the listeners, um, I'd had a, a pretty tough um, a mental health journey, which we will dig into. So I won't talk about that now, but through that um, and, and in my early um, months of healing, I was searching for uh, community um, to, to help me heal places that I would find inspiration and information uh, about living with um, mental illness, um, living with suicide. Validity, um, you know, I'd survived um, suicide attempts, um, and living was was something that I found online. Um, the, you know, the power of social media. It was, um, <clears throat> and the way that um, living was uh, communicating its message just really resonated with me. It, it clicked from the start. You know, I did know of a few others uh, charities that I was following, and everyone's everyone does it differently. Um, I loved the merch element. I loved that it was, you know, a, a real community vibe um, and really grassroots. Um, and I was learning a lot about, um, you know, the shit I was going through. And, uh, you know, so I was just quietly following for a while. And, and then I started to work with my psychologist on um, writing a lot more about my journey um, and, you know, healing from my trauma and stuff. And through that really cathartic process of, um, self counseling through through writing um i uh i thought i might share my story um i'd read some stories and they were very inspirational to me um a lot of them were famous people though and i sort of said you know not that i was the first one to ever share share his story i'm not saying that but it didn't seem to be like there was many just normal blokes and i felt like a pretty normal bloke um to share a story um of just you know living a life you know in a big city and um and things turning pretty pear-shaped and and you know unraveling into mental illness you know not something that i was uh, born with or living with all my life and um that's when i reached out directly to you and casey um that you probably remember you know i shot you guys an email and um and said you know i, I want to do more essentially and um you you guys were straight on it. Um, I'm sure it's a lot harder for you now with the growth you've had in the last few years to get back to everyone. Um, but back then, um, you know, you responded um, with a lot of time and, and effort, I think probably because you had more then than you do now. I know how busy you guys are now and how challenging it must be to try and get back to everyone. I experienced it myself, but you know, I'm very grateful for the time you gave me um, and the encouragement you guys gave me. And, um, and uh, that was a bit around the time that, uh, you were going to go on Survivor, <laughs> and um, you you guys mentioned to me. Um, I actually think I saw it maybe in your um, one of your uh, emails about the Tour de l'Est, the ride that um, you and uh, Society and Co, Living and Society and Co, were putting together to raise awareness for suicide prevention and also um, Indigenous youth education, and um, doing a, a bicycle ride from uh, Sydney to Burley Heads. Um, and I thought, well, I've never ridden a road bike before. I love challenging myself. That sounds extreme, but um, mm. I'll give it a shot. Love so I, I let you guys know. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I, I love a challenge, mate, you know. And um, I needed something at that point. You know, I needed something to – I needed good community. I needed to meet some some new dudes that were doing healthy things. Um, you know, I had a great bunch of mates, but, um, you know, I distanced myself from the drinking and partying scene. and. You know, I was still, I don't know how old I was I back then, 29, 30. Mm. It's probably, it must have been four years ago now. Yeah. Um, three or four years ago. 16, yeah. 16, yeah. So, um, mate, yeah, and that's, look, that's how we came to to connect. And it was a really organic um, journey that we we went on. I shared my story for the first time off the back of sort of launching Tour de l'Est. Um, and, my God, was that a... a unbelievable and unexpected journey that you'd remember you know i remember waking up after sharing that the evening before on social media around june of 16 june july of 2016 and um my email i had like my inboxes were full my instagram my facebook i had thousands of messages that it had been shared across the globe overnight it was one of those things that just went viral and I was extremely overwhelmed. <laughs> um, As my could, anxiety went yeah. through the roof. You know, I called my psychologist. Well, fuck, what am I going to do? I, you know, it freaked me out. Um, I almost wanted to take it back. You know, I was like, I didn't want the whole world to know. I just wanted a few bit. And, you know, yeah. that's the stigma that we talk about. And 
Um, but, you know, it was an amazing journey. It just showed the power of storytelling. Um, it showed how much of a need there is for um, lived experience stories in the world, um, how much people connect with it, how much mental illness and mental health challenges are out there because all the messages were, oh, Dan, you're writing my story. It feels like, you know, you know me. Um, you know, I'm depressed. I've tried to take my life. Okay, it just went on and on and on. And I'm talking like the US. Um, mm. It the picked US, up some, yeah, uh, it got some great coverage. And as you said, it was sort of probably like a shock for you, mate. I mean, getting a story was, out to yeah. a handful of people, then knowing the next day that it was something that was around news outlets in, in various countries and continents was mind boggling, I'm sure, no doubt, and probably brought its own panic and, and anxiety with it as well, mate. But yeah, I know I'm story pretty well because I've had the, the honor of speaking alongside you and we've been mates now for, for over four years. And as he said, mate, it feels like a lifetime, which is, which is amazing. Um, and I know your story, you know, pretty well. Um, obviously mm. listening to you share it in the States, in Australia, doing a lot of keynotes for living, doing your own keynotes and whatnot and sharing your story. But can we unpack that on, on it ain't week to speak? I, I want to share your story on this podcast. I want people to get a very yeah, inside understanding on a deeper level around how severe sure. Sorry, that just, story uh... do you got? Just closing my email because it kept getting pop-ups. Um, mate, yeah, look, I'd, I'd love to share it. I think it's important for your listeners to sort of hear um, hear lived experience stories and, you know, how these because, things unfold. Um, yeah, mate, because, I mean, since you're speaking about it and you've shared it across Livin's platform on a number of occasions, mm. the amount of people that have responded, have emailed in saying, I come across Dan Price's story or I watched your living video on your website and I've researched who Price is and, and the work that he does and his story has actually saved my life. So mm. I, I'd, I'd feel, I'd feel like I wouldn't be doing, I'd be a disservice to, to the audience if we didn't unpack your story right now and, yeah, and for sure. that, you know, what actually went down the suicide attempt and, and how serious that got for you in your life. And, and obviously the days after it, the months after it and, and today and the impact that, it still, it sure. still has today. Absolutely. Yeah, and it does. So, um, you know, I, when I speak now, as you know, I call um, my story, um, my journey to wellness, um, you know, because I, I do believe life is, is a real journey for everyone. Um, that's how I see it. And, um, you know, and I'm still on that journey to wellness every day. Um, I wake up in the morning and I check in with myself. How well am I today? How well did I sleep? Did to Lula wake me up three times like last night, you know, um, did I get myself to the gym? Am I feeling good? Um, you know, all those things, how my stress levels and, you know, that wellness piece is so important. Um, like you said, you know, it's still something that, um, is, is front of mind for me every day, how I'm feeling, um, mentally, physically, emotionally. But, um, yeah, look, my story, um, with, with mental illness and it's something that I only, uh, unpacked probably two years ago. So when I started sharing my story, this part of my story um, wasn't told um, because I hadn't really joined the dots and, and, um, and pieced together how um, fundamental it was to, um, you know, to, to my teenage years, I guess, and then my, my early adulthood. So at seven years old, um, I was diagnosed with ADHD. Um, I, that journey for me was a very tough one. Um, as, as a very young kid um, with a lot of energy and just didn't like being in the classroom. Um, I wasn't a bad student. Um, I didn't really struggle. I didn't have learning difficulties, put it that way. But um, I just love sport, you know, get me outside. I had way, way, way too much energy. And so, you know, the education system, unfortunately, you know, it still probably doesn't cater for kids as, as much as it should. You know, there's not enough diversity. But you know, I was sent out of class a lot. Um, I really struggled. I was the naughty kid. I was laughed at, you know, for, for being kicked out of class. Um, you know, I got sport taken away from me. And, and it's so important because it, it set the grounding for how I felt about myself and the relationship I had with myself. Um, I was picked on and bullied for needing to go to the, the nurse's station at school a couple of times a day to get my, um, my ADHD medication, dexamphetamine, for every four hours. Um, so it was its lifespan at the time. Um, you know, it was just, it made, it was really tough. And <clears throat> so I battled with that, um, 
real identity crisis. You know, I was the hero on the sporting field. Everyone wanted to pick me first if we're playing touch footy. Pricey on my team, you know, when they used to line everyone up every time. But in the classroom, no one, yeah, no one wanted to sit next to me because, um, uh, you know, I'd distract them. I'd talk, I'd fidget, I'd click my pen, you know. I'm not doing anything naughty. You know, I never threw no harm paper at teachers or anything like that. Yeah, look, it, you know, I wasn't a, a, a bad kid, but... I thought I was. I thought there was something wrong with me. And, it, you know, getting whisked off to the doctors and caps put on your head and all these sound tests and everything, it's quite a traumatic experience, I realised. I I'd harboured quite a bit of trauma from that because I felt like a science experiment. Um, you know, and I came out and all I remember, because I don't remember it specifically, I do remember the tests because they were, they were, like I said, traumatic. But all I remember hearing was, um, you know, the doctor speaking to my mum going, yeah, Dan's, Dan's got this problem um we need to give him these pills and he'll be normal that's what i heard that's what i felt um you know and it it really messed me up you know there wasn't enough um education given to me about what i was um, experiencing and um you know it wasn't delivered in a gentle way i was put on a quite a strict diet with no sugar um which is a blessing because i uh, i still eat super healthy always have like i don't drink soft drink or eat junk food because i never really did when i was a kid um, but that, that was the grounding for me to, um, struggle with, with mental illness. Um, not that I really experienced anxiety, um, and or depression until much later in life, but, um, ADHD is a mental illness by, you know, by definition, by diagnosis, um, your brain chemistry is different. Your brain function is different. Um, for me, it comes out in, um, concentration struggles, unless I'm very, very engaged and passionate about something I really can't hold much concentration. Um, my mind wanders very easily um, and it's quite in intrinsically linked with, um, with anxiety in a lot of cases. And, and that's certainly the case for me. Um, something that I, again, I didn't realize until post suicide attempt, you know, and, and getting the right help. But I carried um, my ADHD symptoms through into adulthood. Some people grow out of them. Um, I have been medicated in adulthood for it, but now I don't take that medication. I just do other self care, which we can get into. But anyway, the, the bullying and the identity crisis was the biggest thing for me. I didn't feel good enough. I didn't feel like I fit in. I felt really different, you know. And, um, you know, a lot of people are going through that. But it's just, it's just awful, you know. This, it's just feeling like, you know, you're in, a, you're in a room of people, but, you know, they're judging you because mm -hmm. you feel a bit different. And obviously, the likelihood of them actually being there judging you at, at you know, a a birthday party or a sporting event or whatever it is, is slim to none. Absolutely. But your mind tells you that that's what's happening because that's what um, you feel about yourself. And mm -hmm. it gets projected out into what you think other people think of you, obviously that self-esteem piece. Um, and that's, you know, that's where it all started for me. And then going to, from, you know, year six into high school, year seven, um, full-time all boys boarding school quite a strict school um it was a family tradition my dad had gone there my uncles my granddad um big uh, a big rugby school um i was a soccer player and that was another challenge you know these little things that blokes go through like you know i tried to play rugby but i was small i was picked on for being small i had a high-pitched voice you know when are your balls going to drop pricey like you know all these sort of like little shit but um, I didn't grow. I didn't have a growth spurt until I was 17, you know, like I was tiny. And so I went back to soccer. I was very good at it. I'd played high level soccer from when I was in, when I was 15, I was playing opens, put it that way. So, you know what that's like, you know, mm. um, and I was small, but I was very good. So again, I was going through this thing of like being picked on for being small, but then I was the hero, you know, I, I played first grade tennis and soccer from 15. So I played three years of both, um, you know, I was captain and getting all the awards and things, but um, you know, still getting this, this flip side of, you know, being different and bullying. So I think by about year eight, um, I said to my mom, I just can't take the medication anymore. You know, I'm going through this whole thing again, people teasing me, oh, you know, go take your pills pricey. You know, it was awful. You know, it was really awful. And I didn't realize, um, that from a very young age, from primary school, um, I'd practiced this really toxic behavior, um, of, suppressing how I was feeling. So I never shared with my parents that I was being bullied at school, that um, even parents in the playground were telling me to get away from their kid because I'm naughty and I'm a bad influence. Like it was, you know, and I, I honestly, like I've asked my parents since, like, did I ever get in trouble for anything major? And they're like, no, the, the worst thing you got in trouble for was like saying fuck, 
Wow. You know, and it wasn't yeah. anyone in specifically, you know, like, you yeah. know, I wasn't bullying anyone else or anything like that. So it was quite, you know, and that's just the way, unfortunately, the world was back then and, and still is in a lot of places, you know. Um, but, yeah, I, I've unpacked now that the, the most detrimental part of that, um, you know, of my childhood was that um, I was never... Uh, I never learned the skill of of opening up and sharing how I was feeling. Um, I did the opposite. I, I I was a professional at bearing it, and um, and I coped really well. I don't ever really remember, you know, crying about being picked on or anything like that. I think I had some sort of resilience or didn't really care enough. Um, maybe it was because I had the flip side. I wasn't bullied all the time. I was bullied, and I was also like the guy that was cool and fast and a good skateboarder and awesome at BMX bike riding. And, you know, so I don't know, maybe that was, it was the, the, um, the, the polar opposites that allowed me to not really um, fall into, you know, an adolescent depression, which, you know, bullying can, can certainly do for, for kids. Um, mm, definitely. You know, for, for good reason. But um, mate, yeah, I think the biggest takeaway from that whole experience of my, um, you know, my seven year old self to um, probably 15 years old was um, just constantly practicing that, um, you know, that not sharing how I was feeling and, and not letting teachers or, or my parents or anything know that I was, you know, having a bit of a hard time. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, I never learnt how to do that until, um, until, you know, my life seriously fell apart when I was in my late 20s. Mm, and that's I, I want to and thanks for for sharing that part of the story with us, Pricey. I think it's very important for people to know that you know they they aren't alone. If people feel like they're in their thoughts and you know they're worried about speaking up and seeking help, it's it, it is a very hard thing. And and sometimes people won't understand, and and you might not even understand or how to articulate mm. it. But as we'll we'll unpack, you know, the power of speaking up is is life changing. Absolutely. And, it's it's certainly a skill or a technique or a learning that we, we don't actually learn when we're at school or when we're at mm. college or when we're at workplaces. And that's why, you know, we like to place so much importance on, on speaking up and educating people around the very basic mental health tips and tricks to be able to live better and to be able yeah. to speak up and, and harness that, that strength rather than looking at it as a weakness. And um, your story's, you know reinforcement and it's proof that you know it's it's life changing and life saving yeah. and yeah absolutely excited yeah, for you to, oh, no really excited for you to share this next part with us as well yeah um so you know you can kind of fast forward um a bit of my my story you know there's not a whole lot in it um mental health wise that that's of of huge relevance and takeaways like so um, I finished school. I worked very hard. Um, the The key thing to know, probably in my um, in my later years of high school and and um, and going to university, was that I became a perfectionist. And it's it's something that you do find a lot of people that are struggling with mental health. Um, you know, have this characteristic of just you know needing to be the best and needing to be perfect. Um, obviously, perfect perfection is something that it is in my view, unattainable. It's like an like illusion, nothing, nothing. really, isn't it? It, it doesn't is, even it, exist. It's an illusion. It doesn't even mm. exist, exactly. And, you know, I've, I've had to let that go. I still something that I have to let go of and unpack all the time, trying to be the perfect partner, the perfect father, the perfect guy in the office, you know. It still happens sometimes and it's it's one of my early warning signs of um, a path to burnout for me. So where do you draw the line with that then, Pricey? If you try, if, if perfectionist, if, if you and I both know, we sit here and mm. we know that perfectionism and being perfect, it's, it's just this throwaway word that doesn't have much weight behind it. It's, it's almost like an illusion. It doesn't really exist. It's an unattainable expectation which people strive for. If you and I mm. both know that it doesn't exist, but we still try and achieve perfectionism, how do, you, how do you draw the line there when you find yourself trying to be a perfectionist? How do you snap out of it? What's a tool that you use? Um, def, definitely, um, grounding and mindfulness meditation allows me to, um, get a little bit of clarity, um, and, and journaling as well. Um, unpacking how I'm tracking, you know, my, my sort of, um, thought trends, if you want to call them that, like, where are my thoughts going? Am I, where is my self talk? Um, am I pushing myself too hard? Am I saying things like, fuck, you should have been better there, mate. You can do better than that. Let's go. 
um, you know, stay two hours more at work. You've got to get this done. You've got to do this. You should have done that. The shoulds and the coulds. And, you know, it's that vocabulary that you start using um, in your own mind, um, your own um, internal dialogue, I think, is something that I really check in on. Um, and I, I really try not to let it get there. Like I want to operate um, at 100% effort, but not striving for 100% results all the time mm, you know mm, like important. if that makes sense very, like very, i just it absolutely does man it's very clear you know like because very clearly yeah good. you don't you don't need you don't need to always you know deliver the best report you can possibly deliver like it's a nice to have sure you know you're at work but the reality is you you can't give everything your 100 percent undivided attention and effort it's just not the way it works you, you can't like it's 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 a fantasy if you do that you will burn out um mm. because i've done it and you'll hear in my story how hard i pushed and how far i fell and so how, how, much how I hard did you push mate um <clears throat> very you know i i um it started in those later years of high school um i was you know training in my final years of, of sport and achieving um you know captaincy and and best and fairest um my so my uai this is a good example my uai um so my final marks for people who aren't in australia um or, or don't didn't live in australia like my final grades out of 100 my estimate after my trial final exams was 72 out of 100 which was okay um mm. i felt i was better than that i felt i was smarter than a 72 um i hadn't been doing a lot of the work in the classroom because of how important sport was to me i hadn't been studying much i'd just been getting by my assignments were a bit lackluster some of them 50 percent effort uh, but you know sport was the most important thing in my life it was my passion so it made sense that's where the focus went everyday training everyday playing you know in the gym we're working um and once the sport finished and i had that you know we have that period of um studying for your final exams i was um i was doing all night I was cramming like no tomorrow, um, brainwashing myself with study. Um, it was very extreme. Um, I didn't get sick, but um, my my next door neighbour, so I, I was a boarding school, so I lived there. Um, the bloke in the room next to me, just very small little rooms, little dungeons almost. Um, he, uh, I went away, I came up for an exam and found him passed out on the floor in his own vomit because he'd done too many all-nighters and he'd put himself into a, such a stressed state that he, he had to go to hospital. I thought he was dead. It's very scary, right? But this is what we're doing to ourselves. Um, <clears throat> you know, and, and I got through that, but I took my mark from an estimate of 72, which is pretty on par. You know, that's all your assignments taken into account and your trial exam um, to 85, um, which is pretty, pretty significant jump. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, but that was just really hard work and, and unhealthy hard work. Um, not that it's uncommon, you know, for, for kids, but, it, you know, it wasn't the be all and end all. I did get into the course I wanted to do, which was um, a business and property economics degree. I, I had a bit of an interest in property, although, funnily enough, my passion was um, the human body and sport. You know, I, I did have, I had P, PE on the list, you know, um, sports science on the list and business property economics wow. on the list is like polar opposites. Um, and it's something that I'm sort of trending back to now you know, at 34 years old is, is how I can get more into the, the human movement and wellness space because it's such a holistic, um, you know, way of, of life that I'm really intrigued by how the body and mind connects. But, you know, I went off on that journey. I, um, <clears throat> I, I went straight to full-time uni, um, so straight out of boarding school, didn't have a gap year. Um, I was dating uh, a girl um, from sort of 17 years old and, and we sort of stayed together like young love. And um, I, uh, halfway through uni, I got a scholarship. Um, again, I don't really know how, but um, I got the, the only scholarship on offer to work at a big corporate um, property firm, um, one of the largest ones in the world. And again, you know, just really high achiever, you know, wanting to make dad proud, doing the best I could at everything. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was amazing getting work experience, uh, in the corporate property world, um, while I was still in my final sort of couple of semesters of, of uni, you know, I'm working in the corporate world, um, <clears throat> while still being at uni, you know, I'm 20 years old. The, the importance here, you know, it's not, um, part of my story that I focus on too much when I tell it, but, um, I think the importance is just the fact that, um, 
you know, I was not um, getting any treatment for um, my mental health or, you know, a bit of childhood trauma. Um, I wasn't speaking about how I was feeling um, and I was countering that um, by just being the best. I needed external gratification um, to know that I was good enough. Um, and how are you getting that gratification? Say, what, through work, through, yeah, through relationships, through performance and all that yeah. sort of stuff? Yeah, so just um, my brain was wired um, to win and be the best and get promoted and get the scholarship. Like that scholarship was mine, bro. Like I did not have a distinction average. I had a credit average. There were a lot of people in the class with distinction average, but I wrote the best cover letter. You know, I got my dad to proof it. I got my sister to proof it. I went into that interview and that, that interview was mine. You know, I did everything I needed to do. Told them how much I wanted the job. I'd researched the company. You know, I told them about the annual report. Like I just went above and beyond, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, and I got the gig. Um, Dad, I got, I got the, you know, I got the scholarship. Oh, son, I'm so proud of you, Dan. Well done, mate. You know, like all, all real, um, but very unhealthy, you know, oh, very God, unhealthy way. Of um, yeah, you know, just, and that's, that's how I um, felt like I fit in. The only, the only times I felt that I fit in and that I was good enough and worthy as a human being and as a son and as a boyfriend um, was when I was being praised like being, being told that I was doing a good job. Um, How did that make and, you feel? How did that make you feel behind closed doors? You know, when you get all this external gratification and pats on the back and, you know, congratulations, mm. making your family proud, your, your significant other proud and your brother proud and everyone else in your life proud when you're by yourself, how, did that, how does that actually make you feel? Um, unfortunately, quite empty because I didn't, um, I didn't really believe it. Um, because of, you know, my, my childhood, it, it stayed with me. You know, when you hear people uh, talk about their inner child or, the, or the, that inner child work that you do in psychology um, around sort of healing your childhood programming and trauma, I'd always a very, you know, lonely um, kid, lonely person. You know, I still felt a lot of the time like the seven-year-old kid when I was in my 20s. Um, so... Yeah, look, it was doing it was doing enough to get me by, you know, that external gratification and doing really well. But um, it was it was fairly artificial. Um, and what about when you weren't substance? What about when you weren't getting the external gratification? And obviously, there were times where you probably felt you were slipping down the rabbit hole, so to speak. How did you? Yeah. When you weren't getting those praises, and there would have been times where there might have been a lull in between, you know, getting those pats on the back or reassurances yeah. that you're enough and that yeah. you're doing well. What were you doing for yourself then? Like, how was that, how was that getting counted um, turning to the booze? Was it on, you know, other things like drugs, you know, yeah, look, um, the outlets in life. Like what were you doing? Sure. Um, for a while, um, th there wasn't really any, any outlets or, um, you know, self medication, I call it, but, mm -hmm. um, any of those, those um quite toxic um behavioral patterns um <clears throat> except for um you know a fitness addiction uh, which although healthy um by you know the, the comparison to drinking alcohol mm -hmm. i still believe and i follow someone like russell brand who is a is a huge influence and, and mentor of mine um there are certainly um Un unhealthy healthy addictions and it's, you know you, i know people understand the concept you know i was um i was weighing my food i was counting my macros protein um fat and carbohydrate intake you've seen photos of me mm, um yeah. i uh my mates used to ask me all the time if i'm on steroids like when i went to my five-year reunion boys were like pricey what happened my neck was thicker than my ears. Like mate, stuck you, out you had a big my ears. neck, mate. It was hilarious. Yeah, I, I was, you know, I was <laughs> lifting man. huge weights. <laughs> mate, yeah, I was, you know, I was addicted to the gym. You know why? Because I, I was strong. I had personal trainers watching me lift. You know, I was 85 kilos. I looked 100. Um, and I was completely addicted to, to bodybuilding because you know, because I was strong, like I was a strong man, you know, I was a tiny kid. Now, now I was like, wow, like, look at this bloke, look at his muscles, look how strong he is. Like, and I didn't take steroids ever. Like I've never done that. Um, 
you know, I, I'd never done any recreational drugs until my my mid twenties, till about twenty six, which we'll get to. Um, you know, I was a very healthy guy. I'd have one or two beers most of the time. I wouldn't drink at all um, because I was so addicted to to the training would, element. Would you, you know, would, and do you reckon you would have used the training as a way to silence at the the you know the inner critic and those inner voices in your head, or or was it absolutely. also a way of you getting in so control? as to what you were doing, you were in so much control of your weight, what you put on your plate, how you reacted, yeah. how your body reacted, that that made you feel like you had some control over your life. Do you think that was a big part of it as well? Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, it felt like I was, um, you know, I was really steering the ship. Um, uh, yeah, for sure. You know, and, and I was, you know, I was working in the corporate world and I got respect from the older guys very young. They used to come and train with me. I'd teach them the ropes in the gym. So I had this interesting, like my mentors, I was mentoring in one part of their life. You know, I trained with one of my old, my best old buddies um, who you've met, Brax, mm -hmm. um, at the gym this morning. You know, he's still there um, at the property firm, um, still doing, the, you know, the, the same job. And we sat next to each other for eight years. He's, he's quite a bit older. He looks amazing, but he's 50. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he's still really fit. But he wasn't super fit when I met him and I, you know, turned him into a beast, you know, like we were training together and, and you know, we were doing 10 sessions a week between, wow. between cardio, weights and abs. Like we were talking about this morning, you said like our program was insane. Um, and uh, we we're weighing our food, like chicken breast and broccoli every night, you know, it was, it extreme. It was ridiculous. It extreme. Yeah, it was extreme. Um, I, I wouldn't, um, I'd call, I'd call restaurants, like if, if I was having a family birthday dinner. I wouldn't tell anyone. I'd call them and ask them if they could cook me chicken breast and only <laughs> use a certain oil. You're kidding. Like, mate, I was wow. cooked. Wow. Yeah. But this was my way of, um, of like you said, getting control and, and feeling like, you know, I, I had it in the bag and, and I could keep myself on this path. Um, and some you know, people and use... For, for, and sorry, mate, to jump in, but some people have different outlets to be you know, in control. I know for me, for example... I find I'm on the, I'm probably on the border of, you know, an OCD when it comes to cleaning all the time and feeling mm. like things have to be always in order. And otherwise my life feels like it's in a chaotic mass and it's something mm. that I, I'm always working on, you know, but some people have different, different things where, you know, they're so invested in and, and sometimes we become naive thinking that it is good for us and it's good to be clean or it's good to, you know, go to the gym and be healthy. But, as you said earlier, too much of something becomes sort of like this toxic addiction that starts sure. taking over the way that we operate. And it, and it actually physically changes the way you interact in your relationships with people. Because I'm sure, Pricey, when you were, you, were, you were so into weighing your food and going to the gym and having full control over that part of your life, mm. you probably didn't hang around certain people because they might have ate the wrong thing or they didn't go training and therefore it probably would have yeah. you know, affected the relationships that you had with people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, you know, that was something that was my next point um, is that it did, it became so consuming that, um, you know, it would, it even probably affected my relationship um, with my wife at the time, you know, by that, by, by this stage I was married, I got married at 23 to my high school sweetheart. Um, so you were there for, from for 17. Six, six years at that stage. She got married. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, I was really doing that thing where I was just ticking the boxes. I was promoted at work. Um, I wanted to buy a house. I had a sports car, you know, I was wearing fancy suits. I'm massive. I've got big muscles. Yeah. Tick, 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 tick. Like I'm feeling good about myself. What more can I do to feel good about myself? What other external thing can I attain to make myself feel like I'm good and worthy and doing well at life? You know, what, what thing can I get, um, to make me feel happy? <laughs> You know, and gosh, is that is that so toxic and so um, misguided? Um, you know, both you and I know now, and, and a lot of people are, are finding this out the hard way every single day. Um, nothing external to yourself can bring you real happiness. That is my belief. Um, so um, fast forwarding, we get to this point where, um, you know, I've got everything I think I need to be happy. I've ticked so many boxes. I've bought a house. I've got this fancy sports car I've got, you know, designer watches and, and all sorts of things. And I've got the, the wife and, and, um, you know, the gym's not really cutting it anymore. 
I can't, I'm not really getting the satisfaction anymore. Doing big deals at work, you know, I'm a, the youngest associate director ever at this firm and I'm making big money for a young guy and I'm not that happy, you know? You're what's going happy. on? You know, fuck, what, what's happening? Why do I feel different? Um, sure, my relationship was, you know, sort of growing apart, um, which, you know, is just something that happens naturally for a lot of people, you know, especially when you get together with someone when you're 17. And mm. I was still a kid, Webby, you know, at 25 years old, I hadn't had a lot of life experience. I hadn't gone overseas. You know, I'd been overseas for three weeks at a resort for my honeymoon, you know, like that's it. I hadn't traveled, I hadn't experienced culture. Um, I'd lived in a, a bubble in Sydney. Um, I'd grown up in the corporate world, which is quite a toxic world to grow up in when you think that, the way that those people live is normal. What you see is them working 12 to 15 hour days and going out on the, on the booze, um, you know, whining and dining clients, um, you know, strip clubs, cocaine, like just toxic stuff. Right. And that's this top end of town um, corporate world. And I'm not saying that happens in every business around the country or around the world. Surely not, but um, big cities, you know, have a, uh, you know, big cities in the Western world um, have a, a binge drinking culture. We know that, especially in Australia. Um, and recreational drugs aren't even really frowned upon in a lot of circles. They're uh, they're praised. Um, I remember one time where um, we were out um, partying and people were doing cocaine, and and it was it was um, people who were doing cocaine were asking other people who were smoking, why are you smoking? Because the smoking rules had come and you had to go outside. So it was more frowned upon in this social circle to smoke a cigarette than it was to do wow. cocaine. Okay, it is bizarre, right? Like this is this is this mindset so skewed. But I got Culture. swept up. Yeah, I got swept up in um, this escapism um, in my mid to late 20s. Um, it, it very quickly, so I'd never had that partying life. Um, my marriage was sort of breaking down and I was feeling quite disconnected and, and, and wasn't speaking about that. Um, we were going to marriage counselling, you know, it was looking like it probably wasn't fixable. and I was feeling like a failure, um, you know, thinking that I'm, I'm not a strong enough man, feeling less than because I couldn't fix it. And, you know, this whole, um, you know, I'm not good enough thing that was coming mm-hmm. through. Um, so I started running from those feelings like no tomorrow um, and the, the world of partying, um, you know, kind of lit me up, made me feel welcome. So I wanted to be the best at that. It's buying everyone drinks, doing heaps of shots, doing lots of cocaine, thought I was really cool and escaping into this world that wasn't real. Um, and it just exacerbated my feelings of loneliness, um, you know, uh, hungover days, anxiety we talk about Mm. um i was experiencing um you know it was just it was a toxic byproduct of the self-medication the booze and the recreational drugs were just a toxic byproduct of of my um my brokenness and and um my sense of self um you know my self-esteem being so low um and by that point um you know, it didn't get really, it didn't get really bad. Like I was probably going out once, once or twice a week drinking and, and partying like a big night on the weekends, which is you know fairly common for a lot of people still. Mm-hmm. A lot of my mates still go out and have a big Friday night. Um, but for me, it was, it was why I was doing it. It's all about the why. It's always yeah. about the why. It was about the why when I was lifting weights. Life it was about the why bit, when I was. Yeah, so true. Totally. You know, why are you weighing your food? If I'd asked myself that question, why do you need to be stronger? Why do you need to be bigger? Why do you need to be more ripped? If, if I really dug into that then and understood why I was doing these things, it was because I needed to feel good enough. I needed to be something. The strongest guy in the gym, the most ripped guy in the office, um, the, the most generous guy with um, drinking, you know, like buying everyone drinks and being popular. Like, you know, I was just trying to fit in. I was trying to be something. And, um, yeah, so my why, um, was always um, misplaced and that's okay though you know we all have to go through that that's learning how to do life um you know and I learned the hard way like a lot of people um that yeah you're not going to be happy until you you love who you are and and you believe that you are a good person um and that you're worthy of being here which we all are um 
no matter how broken we are, no matter how traumatic our past, no, no matter what mistakes we've made, you know, mm, um, you know, I started making mistakes. I started feeling very guilty about, um, you know, going out and drinking and spending the money I was spending and being out all night. And, you know, it just not only to my own health, but, you know, I wasn't that person. Why am I doing these things that I, you know, I told myself I'd never do. And, um, you know, my marriage um, then, you know, fell apart. We parted ways. I left. Um, we couldn't fix it. I didn't feel like it was fixable. And it became very tough. You know, it ended up um, in court. So at 28 years old, I'm, I'm, def- I'm getting divorced and in a, in a, you know, a legal battle about, um, you know, our assets and finances is extremely tough. Um, and that's when shit went really pear-shaped. Um, I'm living with my parents for the first time since I was like 21 or something, I think. Um, so I was extremely independent, you know, from a very young age mm. um, and successful, you know, buying a house in Sydney and, and having all that stuff. But, you know, it, there was no question. I, I had a lot of success young and I didn't really know what to do with it. And then it was kind of all gone. It felt like it was all gone. I lost everything overnight is what it felt like. And you hear people say that it wasn't actually true. Um, but what I'd lost was myself completely. Um, in depression, um, you know, panic disorder, anxiety, um, and uh, self-medication through substances by that point. Um, I was completely lost and broken, mate. And I know you know mm. how lonely, um, you know, those places can be from, from the work that you do. And I know you've had your own experiences too. Um, you know, it's an f- extremely lonely place to be, man. Like, it still upsets me thinking about how broken I was, you know. Um, I was crying, putting my suit on in the morning if I could get myself out wow. of bed at all. Struggling to shower. My personal hygiene was shot. You know, I, I was quite like you, really organised. You know, my shirts in my wardrobe were all ironed. They were in colour-coded order. Everything was organised. And then I'd gone to move back to my parents. It was a shambles. I didn't have all my stuff. Um, you know. I'd gone from driving a $120,000 sports car to buying my sister's Barina from her because all my money was tied up. You know, um, I just felt like a failure. I felt like a piece of shit. Um, and that's how I was living in my head. There was zero positive talk. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, everything, there was lots of hateful self-talk, you, you know, all day you're a failure. The panic and anxiety was just crippling, you know, and the depression... Um, was like poison running through my veins, man. It was consuming me. It was it was killing me slowly, um, and I wasn't getting any help. This is the, like the, the the fundamental thing here. The point of this story for the listeners is that I never told anyone how much I was struggling. I, you know, Danny, you okay? You know, you're going through a hard time. I'm fine. Yeah, I'm good, guys. I'm good. The mask came far out. Like my masks were so rock solid. Like I was a professional at faking it. Um, you know, we talk about that, that lie, I'm fine all the time, you know, when we present the living, um, the living well program. Um, and it's so true, you know, fuck, I said it all the time yeah. and it became autopilot. Like it actually became subconscious, <laughs> you know, it just became my program. All right. I'm at work. I'm in a social setting, fake it until I'm so anxious. I have to leave. Some of my mates started calling me the ghost because I disappear. Um, and then thought it was a bit funny, you know, and, and it's sad reflecting on it now because little did they know I was going home or going back to my car and drinking myself to sleep, um, telling my parents I was at my friend's house for the night, telling my friends I was at my parents' house for the night. No one knew where I was. I was sleeping in my car like a, you know, like a homeless person um, because of how broken I was mentally and emotionally. It was awful, you know, and I'm still associate director of a big firm um, sleeping in the car park in my car um, oh, man. and turning up to work every day. Like it was and, a seriously bad place. And all of this, there was, there was no reaching out, asking for help. There was no telling no. someone how you're feeling. And, and how bad did it get, yeah. mate? Because I know we've, we've, we've um, spoken about this yeah. on a number of occasions, but where did that, yeah. where so, did it rather you know, hold out? Um, you know, I got to the point where, you know, when I described those mornings of really struggling to get out of bed, I was having a lot of sick days, um, you know, making up excuses that I'd eaten bad Chinese food and all sorts of, you know, bullshit excuses, um, because I was so mentally unwell. Um, and, but I didn't know that's what it was. I had not joined the dots that 
I was mentally unwell. Um, I had, I was struggling with mental illness and I could get treated and fixed for it. I did not know that. Um, I hadn't had education in mental health, which is why I'm so passionate about it now. Um, because I think I might've joined the dots and maybe could have got help and reached out a lot sooner um, than what we call crisis point. So, you know, my rock bottom came um, after probably I'd say three to six months of it being pretty bad and, and certainly a couple of months of, um, you know, just clinging to life by a thread. And, um, you know, it was the 4th of December, 2014, I'd spent the night um, behind my office building um, in my car, uh, drinking alone uh, as a way to try and turn off my feelings. Um, you know, I'd kind of like drink until I was so exhausted I'd pass out and fall asleep. Um, it was awful. Um, you know, it, it sort of stopped working. I think I was just too broken. Um, I can't quite recall, but uh, I just remember this morning, um, you know, sort of sobbing as the, the clock ticked over to 5 a.m. And, you know, it was almost time to, to do it all again. The sun was going to rise um, shortly. It was just on daybreak. It's still pretty dark. And, um, you know, I'd been feeling quite suicidal for some time. Um, you know, I'd thought about it before. I'd, I'd had essentially a previous suicide attempt where I'd, um, you know, sort of taken a lot of... Um, medications and pills just trying to go to sleep but I just didn't want to wake up you know when I'd wake up in the morning I'd be devastated that I was alive like fuck I've got to do another day like how am I going to do this the energy it took just to get out of bed was man like it was something else you know people are going through this all day every day um you know and I want to help these people you know I want, to, I want them to understand that there's help out there um I didn't know um that at the time and um you know because of that uh, on that morning, I, uh, I walked myself up to the Sydney Harbour Bridge, um, you know, in my suit, um, and I just couldn't do another day. Um, I climbed the outside of the the, the um, fence um, at the start of the bridge in the rocks that you you know well, but you know, a lot of listeners wouldn't know, but um, exactly where I'm talking about. But I then tightrope walked the outside of the Harbour Bridge. Um, to the middle and, and I was there to, to, um, to jump, to, um, take my life. Um, I remember feeling so empty by that point. I, I, um, it was kind of done, you know, um, I'd made the decision. Uh, you know, I sat down, I kind of was still remember, um, it's hard to talk about still all mm. these years later. Um, Thanks I took off my watch and, um, I sat my watch on the railing for my little brother because he really loved this fancy um, watch that I bought myself and I, I did a big deal at work and man, you know, like I had seconds left to live and um, man, before I knew it, there were sirens like surrounding, um, surrounding me. Someone had seen me on the bridge. It's about 5.15 by this point. So it was still dark. Um, and um Mate, like before I knew it, there was a police officer on the fence urging me not to jump. And the first thing I said to him, um, I, you know, I'm really good mates with this guy now, Aaron, Aaron Trevor, he saved my life. Um, he said, mate, you know, don't jump. Like, you know, what's happening? You know, can you talk to me? And I told him that I was there to watch the sunrise and there was nothing to worry about. Like I was dangling from a railing on the outside of the security fence. And I was trying to convince this guy that everything was fine that's how deep my programming of escapism was. Um, and when I stood up and turned around on this railing, um, Aaron said he looked straight through me. He said he'd never seen someone so empty and broken, you know, because I was dead on the inside. Depression had stolen my soul, man. Like, fuck, he was, man, he was so hectic. Like, you know, I, I normally don't go this deep into the story because, you know, I feel what it felt like then. And it is, you know, the thing that upsets me now about it is not just where I was, it's, it's how many people are there every day. You know, we're losing eight Australians to suicide every fucking day, man. In the US, where I did a lot of speaking with you, they're losing 22 ex-military veterans alone every day. Like, this stuff is real, you know? So these people are where I was, and I know how hopeless it is. I know how lonely it is, and I know how painful it is. 
and I'm one of the lucky ones, man. Like I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't have survived the, the walk along the railing. You know, I didn't care if I fell, let alone the rescue. Wow. Once I decided, once I said to Aaron, he convinced me that there was help out there for me. You know, he listened to my story for about 20 minutes. I was just rambling about all the shit that was and, wrong with me and my life. And, and at this stage, was he talking to you through the fence and you were still on, on the other side of the railing? Yeah, so you're talking to him for 20 minutes. And what, what do you think, mate? Up, up until this stage, hmm. I know there's, there's always, you know, there's so much to, to gather in this one story here. And, and I don't yeah. think it's just one story. I think there's, there's so many different stories out of this story. That's life changing and, and will change people's getting lives. A bit but, of sun, getting a bit of sun coming in now. <laughs> it's timing, yeah. mate, timing. And, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what, what, what do you think up until that stage and now looking back and reflecting on it, what, what would you have done differently? And what do you think saved your life? Oh, mate, Other than look, this, this gentleman. Very, yeah. Look, very simply, I would have, um, I would have told my parents, um, or someone, you know, I had a pretty good relationship with my parents. It wasn't, it wasn't a fear about telling my parents. It was just, I didn't know how to tell anyone. I, I, what, I, so you couldn't articulate it. You couldn't actually talk about how you actually exactly. I, I didn't really understand it. Um, it, I felt it was too far gone by that point. I felt like I was just fucked up and this was my path. Mm. I was broken. I'd failed at life. Like, oh, well, fuck. I, I, gave, I gave it a real good go, but I'm done. I'm tired. I'm fine. I'm exhausted, mate. I had zero energy and fight left in me. I'd fought for so long. And I think that's where people get to. Like it's this exhaustion that you don't experience unless you're, so broken with depression mm. that you feel like suicide is and the only valid real option that makes sense, you know, like at the time. Um, so what, so what would you say to anyone right now who's listening, whether it's a, a mother or a father or a, a brother or a sister or just a mate, what would, what advice would you give them? Personal advice would you give them based on your 34 years of existing till this conversation? Mm. What advice would you give someone if they were struggling and they felt like they felt helpless, they felt helpless, they felt worthless and they yeah. didn't want to live anymore? What, what's, what's your advice to them, mate? Personal advice. <sighs> mate, I would say to them, you know, and I've been involved in these conversations, um, which I'm very grateful for. Um, you know, I would say, I promise you hand on heart that things are going to get better. You don't feel that. You don't see that right now, but I guarantee you, they will in time. Things always get better and things always change. The times, the good times will come again. These tough times will pass. Just like the simple analogy of the storm, mm. right? The storm always passes, always. Every single time, the blue sky that I'm looking at right now, fuck, it's beautiful, always, always is there again. It's a constant. And you sometimes know, the sun will shine again and... Yeah, and absolutely it will. And and I think up until this stage, and you've done a lot of brain work and, and what I call, you know, you've done a lot of work at the gym on your mental health yeah. and you still do absolutely. to this day and yeah. you still have to to this day mm -hmm. to, because it helps your life, helps your relationships. But a lot of people aren't there yet. They don't understand that they need to get that sort of help. They don't need that. They don't think they need to get help when it comes to their mindset and I think it's all about, you know, it's a mixture of changing perspectives, having the confidence to speak up, exploring, doing research, educating yourself on what you might be feeling, being proactive rather than being reactive, t putting your hand up Absolutely. if you if you need help because there's no there's no medals for for not asking for help. And Price, you're you're Absolutely. living proof of that, aren't you, mate? I am absolutely. Um, you know, we're we're not asking for help and, and not knowing where the help was. Um, not joining the dots and, and not having mental health education, um, you know, where that all got me, um, where suppressing my feelings and my brokenness got me was, um, you know, attempting to take my life on two occasions, being very determined not to live and being extremely lucky to have lived through that. Um, you know, the, mate, you know, I was... I, I was ready to die that day. And, you know, if, if Aaron and the police hadn't turned up, I wouldn't be here having this conversation with you right now. Yeah. Um, and, you know, but there, mate, my life, like 
the things that I was broken about, mate, like my marriage feeling like a failure, you know, my finances being tied up in court, um, you know, with lawyers and all that stuff, you know, the shame I felt about, you know, doing drugs and, and all this stuff, like, mate, it's all gone. It's, I've healed from it all, you know. Relationships break down. It happens. Part, I've healed from that. Um, mm. You know, people make mistakes. I had to go through that to grow. Um, you know, divorces happen every day. Like it, it, these things that I was really, some of them I don't even remember. You know, I, I was, um, you know, in a, in a sort of toxic um, relationship at the time. Like I was seeing a girl and it was hot and cold. And like, you know, that was really breaking me at the time. And, you know, it's, I've That's healed from that. that. It's yeah, just, yeah, yeah, it's like these things don't, don't really uh, matter. And a lot of them weren't even real. Like feeling like a failure. I, I wasn't a failure. Um, I, I know that. Um, I, I hadn't done a great job at some things, but, you know, that perfectionism was the issue. Like my standards of where I wanted to operate were right up here. And when you're depressed and anxious, mate, you're not going to get there. Good luck. Like you, you just can't because you're not operating. Your brain's not working properly. Your emotions are all over the place. You're tired. You're exhausted. You're struggling to just breathe and live. Like doing, getting out of bed and, and just getting through the day when you're crippled with anxiety and or depression or a, another mental illness, that's huge. Like yeah. you're, you're winning. Like you're achieving. Um, but you're not going to, you know, get 90 or 100% in your exams at uni or at school or whatever. It's impossible. You can't because you're just not functioning. Um, you know, properly. Yeah. And as you and I know, you know, from a brain chemistry point of view, you, you know, your brain is actually unwell. Like it's an mm. illness, your brain's not functioning. Um, and, and, and for everyone that is listening, I mean, and on that very, very note that you just mentioned there, I mean, with the right help and the right level of support and the right interventions and the right self-care strategies and with, you know, within your own life, you can live yeah. an amazing life. You can be very successful. You can manage projects. You can take exams. Price is certainly not saying Absolutely. that if you've got a mental illness, you can't do anything. It's not about that at all. It's when you are physically, Absolutely. it's when your mental illness is taking over and you are in a crisis point and you can't think clearly and you can't operate to, to your capabilities is that's when it starts taking over the very things that you want to achieve in life. And that's what you're saying yeah. to go and get help, to speak to someone, to educate yourself. Yeah. I'm yeah, exactly. So because what works for you price, you might not work for me and might not work for the person next to you. But I'm hearing what you're saying is with the right help and the right level of support, anyone can get back on track and they will see great days again and they will have Absolutely. bad days again, just like you have. Um, you said sure. you've had times since that time, probably where you've, maybe been suicidal again and you know just recently you've had enough you had a miscarriage which i'm sure would have changed your entire life and i'm sure that would have yeah. set you on your own new journey and of struggle and setback which i'd love to talk to you about yeah yeah absolutely like just before i go on that point um about you know recent struggles for sure um you know i just want to yeah clarify and and um and speak about that that self-care stuff you know it, it is not a one size fits all. Um, you know, for the listeners out there who might be struggling, um, you know, I, I was talking about crisis point when I was talking about, you know, not being able to really do life for sure. You know, there are a lot of people that live um, with depression and anxiety like I was turning up to work every day and still getting through life and doing all the things, being a mum, being a dad, um, you know, and that's, that's just the way it is. Um, you know, but I, I want these people that are listening that are struggling in some way. Um, you don't need to have been diagnosed with a mental illness to seek help. Um, you know, just, you know, if you're not feeling well, go and see your GP, um, your doctor. Um, you know, there are some very simple surveys they can do about how you've been feeling lately to pick up on on your trends, your behaviours, your emotions, um, how you're feeling. And there's so much help out there. For me, it's everything from um, traditional psychology, which I still do fortnightly. Um, I do that just because... I've realized that if I stop for three or six months, stuff can build up. But if I'm releasing it every couple of weeks and I'm just talking through, you know, some work stress some financial stress, you know, we're having a miscarriage, like when all that stuff is just there in my diary, it just like my gym sessions are and my meditation every day and my journaling is, um, you know, I stay well. Um, mm -hmm. I eat well every day. I eat a really balanced diet for gut health. Um, a lot of our brain chemistry is manufactured in our gut. You know, the science 
um, you know, can't be argued on that point. Uh, you know, and uh, sleep is, you know, so fundamental and important. But, you know, it, it is, um, you know, it's different for everyone. Um, for it me, I different. need commu- I, I need community. Um, I need really healthy connections. So I'm part of a run club, um, you know, and I, I catch up with people around um, fitness and exercise, you know, in a social setting because it works for me. Um, I don't drink alcohol at all anymore. Um, you know, so there's all these things that, are, that I've found that work for me and, and everyone's different. Um, but that that self care, even when it's um, you know running really well, um, things can still blindside you in life. Like you just you know mentioned, obviously you know. Like, so a couple of years ago, I lost a friend um, to suicide, um, which really broke me, uh, as you know, Webby. Um, you know, Ed passed away, and he was you know he's a great guy. It really blindsided me, like Dwayne's um, death blindsided you and your community. Um, it's a very similar experience. You know, real shock and. Um, you know, just just like that, um, you know, affected me and, and you know, our community. Um, I had a really good self-care at the time. So, um, you know, I didn't fall into... Um, the rabbit you know, hole. That went unco- and, 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 yeah, correct. Yeah, um, because I'd learned a lot of skills. Um, and, you know, just the self-awareness okay. to know, um, to, to go, okay, um, my mate's passed away and he's died by suicide, which for me, working in the suicide prevention space, um, you know, had its own impact on me. Um, yeah. yeah, it was a trigger. I, you know, I'd seen him two days before and um, he hadn't shared with me that he was struggling and I felt like maybe I wasn't there for my friend and all those things. But I worked through it and, um, you know, the same with the miscarriage last year. You know, um, this this one was probably the, the toughest challenge I've had um, and I'm happy to share it because it's something that people don't speak about um, mm. enough. Um, you know, my partner and I, I think we're about 10 weeks pregnant. We met the baby on on the, you know, the sonography and heard the heartbeat and um, she got unwell. She went to hospital. They, they said the baby was fine. You know, we saw it on the screen again and, and then um, she stayed overnight. They thought she had appendicitis or something. You know, it wasn't the hospital's fault. I think she was probably already miscarrying, but um, you know, she had a miscarriage. She was devastated. I was at home off work looking after our, our then, I think Tallulah must've been about one she just started walking, um, you know, and it was just tough, you know, you're in survival mode, you're grieving. I'm trying to look after my partner who's now home on bed rest. I'm off work, work's piling up. Um, finances are stressful. My daughter's, you know, a handful. (laughs) Um, and, uh, mate, I didn't reach out for help. Um, I just tried to be perfect. Like my default is always step up, do everything for everyone else. I'm an empath. I'm a giver. I'm a lover. And I left myself. Um, the one person that didn't get looked after was me and my family saw that after the fact. And, um, you know, they wished that they had seen the warning signs in me. Um, I didn't run for three months. Um, you know, I didn't exercise. So you weren't doing your self-care. My self-care went out the window. Exactly. Um, yeah, I was looking after my daughter pretty much full time for, you know, a little while there, just probably a period of a few weeks. Um, but I burnt out. I wasn't meditating every morning. I wasn't getting to my journaling. Um, and, uh, you know, at this point, I've, I've been off medication. So this is about, um, I think, late August last year, um, 2019. I, uh, I'd been off medication for a few years. I, with my doctor's help, I titrated off my medications. Um, I had been on a mood stabiliser um, for, you know, a bipolar 2 diagnosis. Um, I'd been taking um, a ADHD medication, a single tablet a day, which was working really well for my concentration. I was taking antidepressant. So I'd over time titrated off all those medications at various times um, and, uh, and was living a really healthy, balanced life, um, medication free, but with a lot of self care. You know, when we traveled to the US and mm-hmm. spoke, um, you know, you saw my self care. I know you've got the same, but I was always in the gym. I was recently off ankle surgery and I was still cycling and doing push ups and getting my heart rate up. Um, you know, important and stuff, man, isn't it? Very important. Huge, mm. huge stuff. Um, and everyone needs to do it, you know, because we've all got mental health, just like we have physical health and they're intrinsically linked. And it's the way we stay well and have like a really good baseline for when shit happens. Like when you get blindsided by grief, um, when you lose your job, um, when um, some, yeah, you know, when what, whatever happens um, in life you know your marriage breakdown relationship breakdown like they're the key ones i think financial stress relationship stress um grief you know but 
um, you know, for me, you need that baseline. And I, uh, I lost the baseline um, during the, during this, um, uh, yeah, during this period of grief um, off the back of the miscarriage. It would have been and, and mate, life, mate. It would have been so hard. Oh, mate, it was it was awful, I wouldn't mate. Have and, it down um, anyone, it would have been hard. And yeah, it was hard. I'm, and I'm and sorry um, to hear about that again, man. Yeah, thanks, buddy. And you know, um, but the point the point to this, the the important part of this is um, for the listeners is uh you know healing and wellness is not a linear um journey um you know or like you know a straight line yeah. of healing by any means it's up and down and backwards and it's two like steps a, forward, five, like a roller forward coaster eight. yeah because life is and mm-hmm. um and so i i got to a point where um i unfortunately um became very burnt out again uh i was losing um control of of my health and my life my anxiety was through the roof um i was feeling depressed um i was very fearful of um some suicidal thoughts um creeping back in of not feeling good enough feeling like a failure in some way you know it was all just um mental um none of this stuff was true still had my job still working hard the, the facts were um you know that i was doing really well but unfortunately um you know my mind um through lack of sleep and and lack of self-care and grief um you know got lost in that world again and and you know i am susceptible to it and um i had to reach out for help um you know but i did so much earlier than i needed to you know i was drowning man like i was out the back of the surf um getting pummeled by big big waves man Mm -hmm. and and i put my hand up for the lifeguard and said, like, someone needs to rescue me here. So what I ended up that. happening was my, uh, my psychologist, um, I told her what had been happening and she said, um, Dan, I'm worried about you. Um, I don't even want you to leave my office uh, without someone coming and picking you up because you are very volatile right now. I think you're more volatile than you think you are because mm. I, wanted to be, I wanted to be better than I was. Mm. I was telling her because by that point, by this point, obviously, I was very good at articulating how I was feeling. So I was telling her, these are my thoughts. This is how I'm feeling. But I don't think it's that bad because I needed it to not be that bad. I didn't want to have to You're trying take to sell yourself. Work. Yeah, you're trying to sell yourself. Yeah, you know, like, yeah. you know, because I've got this positive mindset now and I'm like, I'm going to be all right. And I was going to be all right, but I needed a bit yeah, of help. And yeah, I needed someone to step yeah. in and help you. Correct. And, um, and that's, you know, why you have those people in your life, those confidants that can say, Dan, I'm hearing you, and what I'm hearing is you actually need some help. You need some time off work. You need to take a few things off your plate. You are on the path to burnout, and we know where burnout leads for you. Um, and I do, you know. Um, and it had gone a bit too far, you know. I, I believe on a on a brain chemistry um, level, uh, in my brain chemistry had gone a bit awol again, um, you know, because I was feeling these depressed moods and and you know some suicidal thoughts, and 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 they're not they're not pleasant scary um i've got a daughter you know and i was just i was quite scared and um i ended up putting myself back into hospital work my job that i'm still in um were very supportive um i had three weeks uh, of, of sick leave which they paid me for to take That's the awesome. um oh I'm amazing you know and not everyone has this luxury not everyone has a job um you know so i'm very grateful for these things and i understand for some people these crisis points um, much much harder because yeah. of finances. Barriers, so I, finances, I am, location, extre- where people I'm are staying. I'm extremely lucky. Yeah, um, and I empathise with those people who have it a lot tougher than I do and don't have the access to support, the access to medical care. I've got private health insurance, so I was able to get into a private clinic um, near my house in the eastern beaches very quickly. Um, and you know, I I took time out. It was very tough, mate. It was two days before my daughter's first birthday but she needs a father. And, um, you know, I wasn't confident that I could, um, sustain the level of living I was, I was, um, sustaining, um, you know, the stress and all that sort of stuff. So I, um, yeah, I, uh, I went through about, I think I was there for 22 days. I stayed longer than, you know, they could have discharged me earlier. I wasn't at at crisis point, but, um, I needed to time out and, and I found a lot of healing there. I found a new psychologist, that I started digging deeper on some childhood trauma and um, went back on medication, which I'm still on now, Um, you know, and it really recharged me. I probably within six weeks of that, I started feeling really good again. Um, You know, the rebound for me was, was quite fast because I got help 
a lot sooner, sooner than I needed and, to. And you had your um, own self-care strategies. Exactly. Place. Yeah. So I, I, I slipped back are. into them, started getting fit again, started eating well again. So Sleep important, was a big man? one. Yeah. And also just taking off the pressures, um, taking off the job, taking off being a father, taking off being a partner for a few weeks. Like that's a real luxury. And that's why, um, you know, mental health facilities are there for people who just like need a break. And, and I felt like a failure. Sure. I felt shame. Oh, you're a failure, Dan. You're no good. You fuck you. Look, you need to go to hospital again. Um, you know, like all those thoughts were there, but I, you know, through my, my meditation and, and self care, I knew that they were just, um, you know, my, my lack of sense of self, my anxiety, mm-hmm. my depressed brain, um, you know, trying to, mm-hmm trying to corrupt me a well, little bit. I can bit. tell you, Pricey, you've done a lot of work, mate, over the years, and you've done a lot of work on yourself. Um, yeah. You're a testament to, to what you've achieved and what you've inspired a lot of other people to achieve in their life. And I think... Yeah, thanks, brother. I think, well, you've been, a big, you've been a big part of it, mate. So, you know, thank you. And I, yeah, well, mate, it's always good teamwork and I'm always, always grateful to be able to, you know, share stories with you, listen to yours. It feels like every time you tell it, it's like the first time I'm, I'm always so moved by it. And, and you know, you, you hit some very important things on the head, which I want all of our, you know, our audience to take away from this for their own loved ones and for themselves, I think is self-care is definitely number one care. Find what works best for you. Reach out Absolutely. before it's too late and be proactive and start going to the gym. And the gym in my context is a different gym. Yeah. The gym doesn't yeah. always necessarily mean going to pump out weights and jumping on a treadmill and running for an hour. The gym is things yeah. like you said, pricey journaling, things that are good for your health, good for your mental health, your physical health, go for a walk, go to a psychologist, have someone to talk to, have an outlet, put all of these things very much at top of mind as a top priority in your life. And the rest of your life is better off for it. And you know, I'm excited to see where this all goes for you. I know you got another baby on the way. I'm very yeah. excited for, that for you, yeah, mate. Yeah. And what- We've got a baby coming. She's um, well, he or her, he, he or her, is yeah. um, 13 weeks, very healthy. Um, we're really, really excited. We just had our um, a- another scan this week, and and everything's tracking well. So we're very, very relieved um, and and super excited. Yeah. So. Right, things things are going really well. You know, my relationship with Sarah is um, stronger than ever. Our communication is is really really on point, um, which you know brings with it a lot of trust. And you know, we're a real team. And um, you know, I I keep life pretty simple for the most part. You know, and and life's all about um, spending time with my daughter and my family, and um, you know, just getting out and being active, sharing this message, and. Um, you know, I just want to see more love and less hate in the world, man. You know, I want to, I want to see that suicide rate across the globe come down and, and I'm doing my part and, you are. um, you know, life is, life is worth living, man. You know, it's, it's an amazing thing. It's going to get hard at times for people, your listeners, and that's okay. Um, we'll get through it. You know, like you say, Webby, I'll steal your line. If in doubt, reach out. Uh, Very simple. Powerful man. But as you said, Price, it's so true. Um, and you know, we, we hope anyone who is listening to this, that, they're able to reach out and get the help and the support that they very much deserve um, because everyone's got the power to get better and get back on track and start living again. But Pricey, mate, before we wrap up, uh, where can people find you? Where where can they follow you? Where where can they reach out? Yeah. Um, Yeah. You can find me at um, Dan Pricey eight five at uh, on Instagram is probably the easiest. Um, It's my, my original Instagram. Um, Mm -hmm. Put a bit of mental health contact content out there i don't do a whole lot these days um yeah there's no, so selfies, reach out. There's no selfies ladies and him at the gym don't no, no, that. No. <laughs> and he's a taken man but mate we'll uh, we'll include all of your your contacts cool. in the show notes we'll, we'll include them in the episode notes uh yep. and how people can find you'll also send this over into the facebook group um you're listening with it ain't weak to speak here today with daniel price um thank you pricey Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, much for your time for and thanks everyone it. for listening. Um, you know, I, uh, I really, uh, really appreciate the time. Thank Mate, you. thanks so much for, for sharing your story with all of us um, to be able to go deep and go to those places where, you know, as we've witnessed today, it's, it's, you're, it's you're very, very welcome. Mate. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. And um, Big love. our listeners will, uh, will find a lot of value from that into their own lives, mate. So thank you. Thanks, bro. Take much, care. I'll talk to you love. soon, brother. Much love, love. Mate. Much love. See you, brother. See you, bro. Bye, mate.